Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we're going to be talking about what was at one point a work of speculative fiction and is now a work of alternate history. And that's Red Storm Rising. Yes. So Red Storm Rising, this was written by Tom Clancy and a guy named Larry Bond. This was published back in uh, 1986. Yeah, yeah. So before the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and basically it's about a non-nuclear, non-chemical World War III that's fought in Western Europe in the North Atlantic. Yeah. This was the first Tom Clancy book I ever read. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Apparently, most of his books are in the same universe, the Jack Ryan universe or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this... The and, Ryan-verse. The Ryan-verse. <laughs> uh, and like this and SSN are like the, I think, only two ones that are not set yeah. in there. I have read SSN as well. Uh, it's interesting because it's almost like a war game. Mm -hmm. scenario flushed out a little bit more i mean very much so because the backstory of how this got written was that when tom clancy was writing the hunt for red october he picked up this war game called harpoon which was programmed by larry bond and he called up larry bond and was talking to him like oh, you know tell me about this and tell me about that and eventually they got an idea for a world war three scenario and uh, this kind of blossomed out of that so it can be like insanely nitty-gritty in like the little sub to sub combat stuff that goes on yeah, it's almost like it like really lingers on it. It's more about almost about the equipment more than, <laughs> yeah, than the yeah. other stuff. But well, Max, let's go into the sort of the background of how do they how do we get to this alternate situation where World War Three is going to be fought? Right, right. So it was written in eighty six, but it's set in eighty eight. So things are ever so slightly future, different. Max, nineteen eighty eight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, kind of the inciting incident of the book is that in this gigantic collectivized oil refinery, Nizhny Vatarsk, I think, hmm. like four Azerbaijani guys just out of nowhere decide they're going to blow it up. So they like storm the control room, they shoot everybody, they set the valves to maximum, and then just blow up the whole thing in like this unbelievably large explosion. <laughs> It's so large that like satellites see it and think that it might be a ballistic missile launch. But as a result, all this priceless fuel is like blown up and on fire. Mm -hmm. And the Soviet Union is in a really tough sp spot because of that, because so much of their oil that they ran their electricity from and their power plants is up in smoke now. And they're like, oh, what are we going to do? You know? Yes. And instead of saying, well, we're going to just have to buy oil from the west they decide it's better that they want to occupy the gulf states right so they have oil but but first they've got to defeat and dismantle nato Easy. by invading west germany <laughs> no and, problem <laughs> yeah i i've got a lot of issues maybe we'll address it later a lot of issues with that plan is like it's like a cartoon villain's plan. <laughs> it just makes no sense. Because it'd just be too risky to buy it from the u.s because they could jack up the prices or whatever so instead, let's just do the most insanely risky thing possible. Start two different international wars. Which, by the way, require lots of oil. Lots of oil, yeah. Which will become a problem later for them. Oh, God. But yeah, it's so dumb. So they decide they'll have this land war in Western Europe. But as part of the plan, they're not going to use lots of nukes or chemical weapons or whatever. That's like off the table. That doesn't feel very realistic. Doesn't that, feel very Soviet, does it? Yeah, that they would be like, no, 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 we're going to fight this with a very limited <laughs> rules of engagement. <laughs> with, yeah, one hand tied behind our backs the whole time. Yeah, no, this doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's strange. And, and yeah, so they build up to this conventional war. Yeah, it's part of the build up to it. There's like this attack that they do on themselves the kgb concocts False flag, yeah. yeah this fake terrorist attack on the kremlin that ends up like killing some kids and it's used as this like inciting incident they blame it on west germany it's like germany's trying to unify itself by force ah huh. so we've got to teach them a lesson we got to occupy west germany mm -hmm. 
and then not united. <laughs> yeah. And then, then we're going to conquer the Middle East. This is so stupid. <laughs> yeah. And I like there's some like the Soviets create a new version of that movie, Alexander Nevsky. Yeah. Yeah. They do a special re-release of it with new music and stuff like Prokofiev's scores redone and stuff. And one of the main point of view characters is this guy named Robert Tolland. And he's supposed to be like the CIA guy. And he's like, oh, they put out Alexander Nevsky right before this German inciting incident. This must be some KGB plan or something. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> kind of 3D chess kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the war eventually does break out. I guess the big thing is that they launch this amphibious attack on Iceland. Yeah. What's the name of the city? Is it Keflavik? Yeah, it's, a, it's Keflavik. They show up in this cargo ship that's been altered to look like an american cargo ship and it's towing what look like barges but is then revealed to be hovercraft oh my god <laughs> they've got an entire uh, division of like airborne troops inside of it and they just rush the base take it by surprise after it gets just a deluge of missiles dropped on it from backfires and subs and stuff doesn't this book really like missiles so many missiles in this book. <laughs> There's a million friggin' missiles yes. everywhere. Yes. <laughs> I learned that when you're on a ship and you're under missile attack, the code word for it is vampire. Vampire, vampire. Oh, no. We, we got 50 kingfishes heading towards us. Oh, shit. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Which is so funny to like read this book after reading that Falkland Islands book. <laughs> The what? dreaded sea slug. We've got 50 sea slugs <laughs> heading our way. <laughs> the HMS Glamalgan is back. Uh. <laughs> Exocets everywhere. <laughs> yeah, like one or two Exocets is like this big deal. And there's like 50 of the Russian equivalent like heading towards ships and stuff. Um, oh my goodness. Do they do have CIWSs now, the little uh, mini guns. Yeah, mini guns, yeah. That, yeah. That which that was a big problem for the British is that they didn't have that. All they had was missile stuff. <laughs> so, you know, but in this book, they still have problems mm -hmm. with like locking onto stuff when it's too close together. Like there'll mm -hmm. be two missiles coming and then neither of them will get shot down because it can't make a lock and stuff. Oh, wow. They do this. The allies try to take Iceland back and at first fail. Launch a B-52 raid that gets defeated. Yeah, they start from Barksdale, but they don't go straight from Barksdale. They stop over in like Canada or yeah, something. Yeah, Gander probably in, Gander. Um, in New Newfoundland. Oh, okay. Not right. Newfoundland. <laughs> Newfoundland. <laughs> Newfoundland. <laughs> Newfoundland. Newfoundland. <laughs> Hooray for Helsinki. Yeah, um, New Helsinki, yes. <laughs> um, but Helsinki West. No, so... Um, <laughs> Also, the Soviets launch a land invasion of Germany, mm -hmm. and but the I guess the Allies or NATO, I guess you would call them, really managed to foil this. Yeah, pretty it, well. It's kind of silly. One of the colonels ha has like information about it, and he's in Germany because he's about to meet up with a team of Spetsnaz, and they're going to knock out some radar dishes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But on the way there, he gets hit by a car. <laughs> So they take him to the hospital and they pull an envelope out of his shirt, open it up and look at it. It's like, oh, crap. Oh, no. <laughs> so they get forewarning about it for a couple hours oh, wow. ahead of time. And um, that actually captures pretty well the vagarities of life that really <laughs> things like that do happen. You know, like yeah. we've got this big plan in place and then something stupid like that happens. <laughs> and that's that's something I think this book does pretty well. Just random chaotic stuff mm -hmm. that nobody could have planned for becoming an issue. Mm hmm. It's the nature of warfare. Yeah. But then also the Americans have this plane that doesn't actually exist in reality, but it's like kind of modeled after something. Yeah. The F-19A Ghost Rider is what they call it in the book. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. <laughs> Starring Nicolas Ghost Cage. Cage. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. Ghost Rider 2, Spirit of Vengeance. Oh, God. With Idris Elba. That's a, that, what a film that is. I'll I'm tell you sure. What. I've never deemed to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but um so the f-19 is based on the f-117 yeah yeah the nighthawk the big weird boxy thing that looks like it's from an arcade game or something yeah it's like goofy you see him like back during the first gulf war they're like yeah this thing's <laughs> the best ah, super advanced and now it's like ugh, not so much yeah we know one got actually shot down by serbia that's in, right in yeah the 90s they put it up in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. Um, but this is like different from that because mm -hmm. like the real F-117 
one seventeen is all boxy with with sharp angles everywhere, mm-hmm. and this is described as being sleek and curved and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like the nickname for it is the frisbee. UFO. <laughs> the Frisbees of Dreamland is the name of one of the chapters because Dreamland is the nickname for Area Fifty One ah. for like the you know Air Force and stuff. Interesting. So, but I guess what's interesting is that the Soviets have the most success in this attack on Iceland. Yeah. Whereas, like in Germany, they get blunted pretty quickly. It's kind of the exact opposite of what people would expect, where like you'd think that the land war would just be totally dominated by the Soviets, but the Allies would own the seas. But it's the exact opposite here. They get bogged down fighting the West Germans and stuff. Leopard twos. Leopard twos, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Challengers. There's challengers uh, there. Challengers. Probably some Abramses thrown in. Abramses, yeah. I think the only Soviet tank, they talk about the T-80 a whole lot. And mm-hmm. I, they don't really talk about 72s or anything well, else. They would have had T-72s and T-80s, yeah. BMPs. They, there's a lot of BMPs. Yes. yes. Amphibious. Armored personal carriers. Yes. Uh. Screw you, Brad. Um, is it Bradley an armored personnel carrier? Yeah. Or is it? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Did the did the Soviets still have like tank destroyers and stuff into the eighties? Nah, no, they would have just said tanks. I mean, they had like there were some BMPs that had missiles on them, like anti tank missiles. But, oh, like you know, tow they, missiles and stuff. Uh yeah, kind saggers of. and Sagger? stuff. Sagger, that was one type. Yeah, there's various types. Okay, okay. but um, <laughs> no, they did not have like SU one hundreds. Hundred and fifty millimeter. You know, yeah, like, oh my god, SU-152s. what is this? One fifty twos. Um, is that the point of the main battle tank that the, the tank just does everything yeah, the main battle tank does all things it's anti-tank it's anti-personnel it's heavy but it moves quickly it can do everything mm-hmm. so yeah instead of you know having like heavy tanks medium tanks tank destroyers all that jazz um so um also also the war is fought in space max oh god too. <laughs> that was the coolest thing for me about this book like i decided to read it because a commenter mentioned it mm-hmm. and was talking about like oh it goes into all sorts of cool things like satellite warfare and i thought that's awesome mm-hmm. that is so cool what a cool idea and it, it's very well executed in this book it's awesome like uh the soviets they uh they launch kill vehicles these like kamikaze satellites that just thrust into the american spy satellites and blow them up without any like explosives just from sheer velocity interesting yeah sort of like in uh is it you only live twice the thing that steals the satellites <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's got like the big it's got the big jaws yeah it's got like a or it steals spaceships excuse me sorry yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Moonraker, same thing. They <laughs> they steal the 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 Moonraker of the title is like a uh, space shuttle that mm-hmm. I think they steal at the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like on a jumbo jet or something that blows up. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, the best James Bond movie. So good. I mean, it's that, and you only Octopussy. live twice. Octopussy, of course, of course. Uh, for your eyes only. For your eyes only. Yes. Is that the one that's in Japan with the mm. with the rocket bullet guns? No, that's that's uh, you only live twice. No. Yes, that really? is. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Huh. That's the one where he has the cigarette that shoots like explosive <laughs> all that. Um, that's the one with Blofeld and he's got the cat and that's like the classic, okay. you know, like yeah. what Dr. Evil's modeled on, you know. <laughs> uh you uh live and let die, another great one. I actually like that one. Yafakoto, you know? That's right, yeah. As the gun that inflates things. Yeah. <laughs> somehow. It somehow manages to inflate things that are not usual inflatables. Like people. Like people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, but back to Red Storm Rising. Red Storm Rising. So yeah. um, there's, there's landings in Norway, too. We don't really see them, mm-hmm. but they're attacking from the Kola Peninsula, oh. and they like... Too many fjords, my friend. Too <laughs> There's many. So, so many fjords. I don't think Finland is in this war, which would be mm-hmm. helpful in this Scandinavian war here. Like, like this very arbitrary border that's just kind of there that you can't cross over. <laughs> like, I don't know. That's right. Eventually, Iceland gets retaken. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a weatherman who works at the air base there, and he manages to slip away just in time before like the the russians land and he runs off with a bunch of marines and does 
Red Dawn stuff. God. <laughs> He's got like a pistol grip transmitter. He like points it at the American satellite and like talks to the guy. His handler is in like Scotland or whatever, and they have him like go to these coordinates and look over and look in this direction, you know. Huh. Oh, uh, there's some backfires landing at this air, airport. Oh, you should do this or that. Hmm. Interesting. But ultimately, it becomes, I guess, the war becomes a stalemate in Germany, mm-hmm. and the Politburo decides they're going to have to use tactical nukes. <laughs> and that's just one step too far. Yeah. It's like uh, the commander or whatever, who's starting to have some doubts. I think his name's Sergatov. He's like, well, in order to use these nukes, I'll have to have total control of them. Because he thinks that's going to be like, oh, okay, never mind. But they're like, sure. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Not a big deal. Wherever you want them, however you want them. And he's like, that's the moment he's like, I'm convinced these guys are idiots. What is wrong with you people? Mm-hmm. And he colludes with like a, a couple other generals in the KGB to just take over the country in a coup. And, um, and then they bring peace and then they start buying oil from the United <laughs> States. It's good old American <laughs> capitalism. And, you know, America doesn't feel any hard feelings about this war. They're happy to sell it to them at competitive prices. You know, it's not a problem. <laughs> I got a deal for you. <laughs> I, I know a man named Albert Fall here. He's great at making deals. Um, <laughs> but... um. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty good book. I liked mm-hmm. it quite a bit. There's like a ton of POV characters. So many that I kind of got them mixed up a lot. Turtle Dove-esque, <laughs> you could say? Yes, it's quite Turtle Dove-esque. Except, though, one difference from Turtle Dove is that if this was a Turtle Dove book, half the book would be about a guy talking about moving refrigerators or whatever. <laughs> and then be like, oh, and by the way, Iceland was just captured by the Soviets. <laughs> oh. I just listened to the wireless, and I, I hear... Iceland's been captured. Um, the moving picture wireless. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I love Harry. Absolutely love oh, him. Oh, I do too. And, you know, like I, in a lot of ways, I think that that slice of life stuff is maybe even superior to this kind of book. But I think this book does what it does very well. The whole nitty gritty, like mm-hmm. tactical crap stuff that I don't understand what the heck they're talking about with subs and stuff. Mm-hmm. They talk about so many different types of submarines, and it's just, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Oliver class, a Kula uh, class. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah. We don't have any point of reference because mm-hmm. it's like there wasn't any war that used these subs. So it's like, who cares, you know? Yeah. Well, it was a very specialized set of knowledge. It wasn't, you know, general, general mm-hmm. knowledge stuff. But I think there's only two submarine caused sinkings of major ships after World War II. One, he's in the Falklands War, the HMS Conqueror. Yes. Yes. Uh And number two is like some, in the war between India and Pakistan, there was some sinking of some ship. I don't know the name of it. But that's literally (laughs) it. That's all there is. So, I mean, there's not much. That we know of, Max. That we know. (laughs) The secret, yes, secret stuff. Black ops, (laughs) nuclear submarines. (laughs) 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 You know, when we fought the, the underwater UFOs, you know. That's right. Right. Um, That I learned about from the History Channel. Yes. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, let's let's just talk about maybe our observations about this, which is, I got to say, this plan sounds insane. Yeah. It sounds like the dumbest thing that you could possibly (laughs) imagine, that you would put your honor so far ahead of just buying oil that you'd rather kill like... Ten, probably tens of thousands, if not more, of your own citizens and cause a huge wreck and spend all of the oil you may have saved up really quickly <laughs> on what is just like a crazy like Indiana Jones plan. Like it's it's putting the cart before the horse, really. You just make a much bigger problem than like, oh, we have to ration electricity for the next three years. Mm-hmm. It's the Soviet Union. They're going <laughs> to. Yeah, they're huge. They have so much resources. I know, know, which I find so weird that destroying one oil refinery would like cripple one country. Well, they kind of expl- they, they, they make an explanation that like, oh, this refinery is like a super refinery. It's super, super big and they only have so many in their whole country. But, you know, there's like a bunch of techno babble explaining <laughs> it, which I'm sure is maybe not 100 percent accurate. It's just to mystify you into accepting, OK, whatever this I guess this makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and what Gulf state are they going to take over? All of All them? All of them? But Iran, Iraq, <laughs> Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, yeah. Oman, Trucial Oman. 
Qatar. Also known as the UAE. Oh, what? Trucial Oman. That's what it used to be called. The other Oman. Huh. Does South Yemen still exist at this I point? I think it does, yeah. Uh, well, they're they're Soviet aligned, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Iraq, they're kind of Soviet aligned. Syria, I don't know how much oil Syria has, but... Was Venezuela, did they have their Bolivarian revolution at that point? I don't or? think so. Okay, all right. They can't buy them. They got to go through Turkey. Turkey, okay. Yeah. Your most direct route is through Iran, which is not probably in the 80s going to just be like, okay, guys, come on through. There you go. Yeah, it's totally ridiculous. I mean, okay, so what's your goal in this war? All right, attacking Western Europe, right, to destroy NATO. How, when does the war end? When you occupy Western Germany, do you have to push all the way to Paris, to London? <laughs> like, when does this? When is the war over? You know? Yeah. Because they could just keep on fighting, tooth and nail. Exactly. So. Well, it just seems this doesn't sound like a particularly well thought out plan. No. <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> the fact that the Soviets are like this war would only be fought in Europe, like not thinking about the Pacific. Well, in the story and like the setup, because of their false flag thing a lot of nato states take that as justification to not get involved they're like well nato only works when a nato country is attacked first if a nato country attacks russia first then i'm not obligated to join so since western germany in this scenario attacked russia it's like well i don't have to why would everyone believe that because they want to believe it because they don't want to get involved with world war three well, i think actually it's what they call plot armor <laughs> there's that too yeah it's like but it has to have. Yeah, because of that, South Korea and Japan don't get involved. So it's like, okay, no Pacific. Don't have to worry about that. We don't need the self-defense force anyway. Yeah. Self-offense yeah. force, more like it. <laughs> um, but that, that could have been cool if they included the Pacific. But at that point, your scope is getting so big that maybe it's just too damn complicated. That's true. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I'm sure the Soviets had subs and stuff in the Pacific that they could use. They got bases in like Kam Kamchatka or whatever. So no, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, no, it seems pretty, pretty strange. Yeah. Yeah. But what I do find interesting is, is that what this does posit is, is that the idea that just haunted NATO planners for 40 years, which is the idea of a, a ground war in, mm -hmm. in central Europe. The thing of which is interesting about this, I think you kind of mentioned it earlier is, is that I, this is when I, you talk about alternate stuff is that, I feel like it kind of reverses it because usually you'd think that that the Soviets would dominate the land because that was what the Americans kind of assumed is we're going to have to use nuclear weapons because the amount of forces that we have positioned in Germany just simply is not enough to hold back a Russian invasion. Like Warsaw Pact invasion is just going to overrun everything. And once you start using nukes, I mean, kind of the gloves are off right mm -hmm. there, you know. The fact that the Americans wouldn't result to using tactical nukes in this situation is pretty shocking. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's what it. you think. Because like in that Steel Panthers game I mentioned before, there's a bunch of scenarios where it's like the Soviets invade in the 1980s. And it's just for every, if you play as the Americans or the french or the germans or the british or whatever it's just you're overwhelmed just left and right just it's just like this onslaught of like it's just sheer numbers at every turn huh. and you're just like boom boom, boom 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 you're just trying to shoot everything but you mm -hmm. can't you mm -hmm. know and i mean their equipment's great you know it's good very well it good. wasn't like the soviets were using a bunch of t-34s like i mean they had good good equipment yeah, yeah. i mean a t-80 was a good tank it was a good mm -hmm. tank they still use them i think although t-90s and there's some new thing that's replacing it as well but you know i that's what I do like that they have that scenario because that's what planner, they were just obsessed about. And if you look at the American position in Western Europe, I don't know if it would have been strong enough to hold back mm -hmm. a Soviet invasion. Well, if you read the, the book Team Yankee, it'll tell you that a single tank can... <laughs> <laughs> just joking uh, but i mean Yankee. that's another that's another land war in europe cold war kind of thing yeah. is it the same time period i read part of it i never finished it is yeah it i read it it was yeah mid to late 1980s i think in team yankee the, the abrams has a 105 millimeter gun hmm. which is earlier i think it's 86 or 88 when the 120 millimeter abrams comes into service okay did they use those exclusively in the gulf war or was it a mix of both i think it was mostly 120 but i think the 105 also made some appearances interesting okay yeah rifled 105 smoothbore 120 <laughs> huh because the gun on an abrams is basically the gun from a leopard too <laughs> okay okay so huh. 
Well, the British Challenger uses a rifled 120 millimeter gun. So what's the difference? So what I've been told for the big guns is that the smoothbore allows a much wider range of ammunition to be used. Okay, so you can put your flechettes in there. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Hmm. The, you'd think the rifling would make it better, but I guess they they use it smoothbore has some advantage. Does one have a muzzle <laughs> break? shoot a big cannonball out of it. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Get your chain shot, boys. <laughs> Give Sodom some of that old chain shot. Grape shot. <laughs> Loading grape shot. <laughs> Loading canister. <laughs> well, they do have the beehive rounds, but... Oh, yeah. But is that the flechettes or is that... Flechettes, yeah, okay, which is, is functional canister. Shoot leaflets at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that actually happened in a... Um, there was a guy in the Vietnam War who won a Medal of Honor. It was like his, it was like a fire base that was attacked in the Mekong Delta, and he was like an artilleryman, and he um, he was uni- he was using like beehive rounds against the, like these human wave attacks by the Viet Cong, and he like ran out of ammunition at the end. He fired the last round he had was like a bunch of leaflets, <laughs> like fired a bunch of them at that, and then left. Huh. Was this from artillery or from a uh, patent tank? 105. 105, 105 artillery. I yeah. see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Take that. Maybe this will stop you, convince you to embrace American capitalism. <laughs> huh. But um, this is, I do like that it addresses the nature of this and also how vulnerable like Iceland, something like that is, because if you take Iceland, you're sitting right on the, the quickest transportation route by air from the United States to Western Europe. Yeah, I mean, when I was first reading it, I was thinking, Iceland, really? Like, what? Until I looked at it on a map and stuff, and I was like, oh, okay, I kind of see. I kind of see why that's so bad, because it's so close to the UK, mm-hmm. and all ships have to go through that area yeah. unless you're going through the channel, I mean, if I you guess. fly to Western Europe, usually that's the route you take. If you're going to, like, London or Paris or whatever, like, it goes, kind of curves up near Iceland. You know, the planes, I think they always have that thing in the headset, like, if you press, like, <laughs> where's the map, and you can see where the plane is, it kind of flies up near there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they don't just fly straight across the Atlantic. Yeah, not in a straight line because the world is a sphere. You don't yes. go point A to point B. Well, according to you, Max. According to me. That's just my opinion. <laughs> that's just your opinion. All right. Um, <laughs> Ice walls, Max. <laughs> All right. Yes, yes. The inner earth. You know. <laughs> no, but also because it also keeps you kind of near land. So if you have an emergency, it's better to ditch or try and get to Iceland than, you know. <laughs> Whoops, <laughs> middle of the Atlantic. Here you go. Um, rogue waves, all rogue that good waves. stuff. <laughs> the Sargasso Sea, yeah. you know. Um, we have to get to the Azores. The Azores. <laughs> Bermuda, here we come. Uh, let me think. Um, Bermuda. Bermuda. That was from a Documentary Now episode, the one where they're oh. the, the globe salesmen, and they go, <laughs> they, go to the, they, they go to the kid's house, and they're talking to some kid, and he's like, this globe's wrong. And he's like, no, it's right. He's like, it says Bermuda, and then, like he points to it, and it says Bermuda on there. <laughs> That's a great series, by the way. I'm a big fan. Um, something, uh, something that kind of I thought was weird about this book is the fact that that the words Soviet and Russian are synonymous in this book. It's just like the Russians mm. this, the Russians that. Yeah. But you don't hear about oh the first Ukrainian front or whatever. I think by that point they had changed it. So everything's mixed. They're all mixed together. I think it's just like army. It's like you know fourth front, seventh army, tenth guards, tank division. So the the Warsaw Pact members. I don't entirely understand this, but some of them are like sovereign nations separate from the Soviet Union. Yes. Poland is not part of the Soviet Union. Yes. So is Poland sending troops to fight in this are they obligated to or i would guess they would be i mean that's what the american planners always assumed in these cold war plans is that it would be a general attack by the warsaw pact in in any case you got to allow them access through your country Mm -hmm. yeah i guess right i mean you'd have to i don't think they would be standing on the sidelines at least east germany wouldn't be (laughs) yeah which is also funny that like the justification Mm -hmm. of this war is german aggression german nationalism and it's like you got half of germany in your sphere but the good half max the good half yeah a good old gdr (laughs) or ddr depending on who you ask deutschland democratic republic well yeah deutsch deutsch revolution (laughs) (laughs) oh east germany they have a uh, song, The Party is Always Right. That really? was like one of the, the anthems. 
which is such a stupid thing. The to socialist say. kiss of friendship. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Eric Honecker? Yeah. yeah. Impression, of. impression of getting a little too close there. Yeah. That's pretty weird. <laughs> Even at the time, I think that was pretty weird to be your world yeah. leaders kissing each other yeah. on the mouth. On the mouth. Yeah. Because there are some cultures like, you know, in like French in like the French culture, mm. men will sometimes greet each other by like kissing themselves, like kissing each other on the Kiss cheek. Kiss myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, like, a, like kissing each other Brown. on the cheek. A non-family member kiss on the cheek. Mm. But like, I don't know if any cultures that, you know, men who don't know each other greet each other by kissing each other on the lips. Oh, no, no. They know each other. They're they're very respectful of one another. It's <laughs> 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 so weird. And I think there's a couple other pictures of Brezhnev doing that to some other people and stuff. Oh, and that was part of the Sino-Soviet split was that their diplomats stopped kissing each other. Don't kiss the Chinese diplomat anymore. That's, it's verboten now. <laughs> Mao says no. They're not our fraternal socialist allies anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got to keep it to the cheeks. No, no, <laughs> no lips. The lips aren't in play. <laughs> no tongue. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, mm. I mean, it's very kind of focused on the military side, but it is mm. interesting, the idea that the Soviet Union, although I feel like any Soviet justification for this sort of war would be some sort of breakdown in relations with the West. It wouldn't be like, oil, oil, I need that oil. They read the book Oil and were like, we need some of this. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. I would love to have that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, maybe like a more plausible thing would be maybe NATO would do something bad or maybe provocational or whatever, and then that would lead to this breakdown. This whole resource thing is just kind of silly. doesn't make sense. Plus, you know, like, okay, let's say you attack these Gulf states or whatever. What's the first thing they're going to do? Blow up their oil wells, blow up their refineries. So you got the, you got the same problem again. I mean, maybe it would work in the first country that you take over, but they're going to catch the hint after that, you know. Put down the AK-47, pull out your wallet, and pull out some of those, those nice rubles. <laughs> Pay up. Um, rubles. Rubles. I think there's other Barney rubble. There's that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's other Cold War hot books kind of like this out there. There are. There's like one called like World War Three. I think I've looked through part of it. I remember there's like a map in it and it tracks the progress, different maps. Oh. One of them shows the Soviets in like the Netherlands. Like the British just do a terrible job of repulsing the Soviets. The Americans <laughs> like kind of hold them back, but the, the British are just like, whoops. <laughs> oh, sorry. They're just too distracted. Fighting the war in Argentina. Trench warfare. No, <laughs> Perfect timing. Oh, no. Yeah, like, I guess you could have, like, a situation where, for whatever reason, the United States just doesn't want to do it, and all the European allies have to die. I don't know. That's ridiculous, I know, but yeah. for war gaming purposes. Yeah. They would be even worse off. I think a lot of American strategic planners believe, basically, we're going to lose a lot of Western Europe if the Soviets attack yeah. us. So that's why we have to keep up with, like, air power and... You know, if you think about it, a lot of the American ground equipment wasn't really the equivalent of the Soviets until late in the Cold War. I really? Mean, like, look at Soviet tanks in the 60s versus, like, American tanks. Okay. Yeah, you had maybe the 105 M60 Patton, but there weren't a lot of them. You're mm -hmm. still relying heavily on the M48, which had a 90-millimeter gun, which wasn't even sufficient to take out some German tanks in World War II, <laughs> let alone, you know, a T-62. <laughs> I'm not very familiar with the M48, you said? The M48. It has, like, a weird, interesting muzzle brake on the front. Mm-hmm. So is it like a Sherman? Like, what is it like? Does it look like a Patton? No, it looks tank? like a Patton. Okay. Okay. They use them in, um, not in the Patton movie because those are M47 Pattons, the earlier model that the Germans use and the Americans mm. use the Walker Bulldogs. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, no one can use a freaking Sherman tank. They were, people were There's... living who were from then. They're living now. <laughs> they can tell you what tanks we were using. Not Pattons. Not Pattons. Um, they were still using Sherman tanks all over the world at that point in South America and Israel and stuff mm -hmm. in the 60s. The Isherman, the M41 into the 70s. Uh, yeah. Super Shermans. Super, super duper Shermans. That's right. <laughs> Upscaled to 120 millimeter. 100, 100, 100, yeah, they put a 105 millimeter gun uh, yeah. on them, which probably made for a pretty damn cramped turret. I imagine. God, tanks look like a nightmare to be inside of one of those. Like I was looking at pictures at the inside of a T-80 mm -hmm. and it's just, oh God, it, it's, so, it's so cramped and tiny. I've been inside the inside of two tanks. I've been inside a, a Chieftain and I've been inside a World War I Mark IV, which right. is nightmare. That would be a nightmare <laughs> to be inside. Especially because there's like 12 other guys inside. Yeah. 
and then the chieftain there's like there's buttons everywhere and switches and you're like <laughs> oh good i'm gonna hit something <laughs> and in the heat imagine being one one in the desert Ugh. the thing that blows my mind is that back in world war ii the only navy that had air conditioning inside of submarines was the americans and nobody else had refrigeration or air conditioning Sounds like a lot of salt pork. <laughs> salt pork that goes bad, bread that gets soggy and moldy and stuff. It just it sounds horrible. It's hot and it smells awful. It's just a nightmare. And that's something I was thinking about in this book is like, that must be the most the worst thing in the world, being in a submarine that gets torpedoed and sunk. Like, well, you're going to die pretty quick probably. Well, that's true. But still, pretty, Not great. pretty scary. Not yeah. great. Yeah. Not ideal. Yeah. So um no it's uh No, it's interesting, but it's I think this this raises interesting questions and I think the Americans do better than perhaps they may have done, but who knows. Yeah. It's an unfought war. Part part of the fun is that nothing goes according to plan. You know, mm-hmm. no plan survives contact with the enemy. So the way things are supposed to go, it can go radically different just depending on tiny little things. Something that's kind of neat, unlike how the Warsaw Pact is not really presented very well in this book the allies the nato allies do get their own little niches and roles and stuff like the west germans and the british and even the belgians are fighting yes <laughs> the mighty belgians did they have a significant military back then obviously they don't have much probably, of one now probably not much bigger than it is now maybe somewhat bigger mm-hmm. but you know it's interesting enough is that what people don't i guess realize is that most western european countries had mandatory conscription until not that long ago like really? italy had mandatory conscription until like 2002 are you for real yeah and some for countries like why? norway and switzerland still have it yeah oh. if you look at countries with mandatory conscription it's most western european countries france had it until like I think the 80s or 90s, Spain had it for a long time. Britain ended in 1960. It was actually relatively early that the draft ended for like Britain and the US. The Netherlands had mandatory conscription. West Germany, all the Warsaw Pact countries certainly did. But like, I think Sweden and the Norway and Denmark may still have mandatory conscription. I know Finland definitely does too. That makes the most sense, Finland, because they're right next to Russia and they're not a member of NATO. So Mm -hmm. they're defenseless if they can't defend themselves. Mm -hmm. But like Denmark, that seems weird. (laughs) It's going to get overrun pretty quick. Yeah, for real. Are the Baltic states, are they members of NATO or are they? Now they are. Now they are. Yeah, Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia, I think, are. Wow. Okay. And they're, <laughs> they, they border, at least some of them border Russia on both sides because of Kaliningrad. Yeah. Uh, Lithuania does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that place packed with nukes or something or packed with tanks or whatever? Is it? It may be. I think it's got a big military base there. I think they do have a very big military base there. Old Kaliningrad. AKA. <laughs> AKA East Prussia. Yeah. Konigs- Konigsberg. Old Konigsberg is now Kaliningrad. Yeah. Yeah. It's this little exclave. Uh, so strange. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting that they held on to it and they just didn't give it to like Lithuania or something like that. <laughs> no, we'll be holding on to this. Thank you very much. This belongs to us now. That's an interesting thing. I'd like to know more about that. Who lives there? After this, we could look it up. We could look it up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Let's see. Oh, 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 oh. Something else about this book that I thought was interesting is that the Soviets don't attack the United States in any way outside of Europe when, you know, they probably should. You'd figure they would. Yeah, blow up the Panama Canal. Attack Alaska or the West Coast or the East Coast or something. Yeah, exactly. Shoot some some missiles at refineries and, you know. In the era of total war, why would you say we're just putting aside, there'll be no attacks on the enemy's capital. We're just going to settle this for good and all with with real military force instead of... (laughs) Roll our sleeves up and have a good old fair fight here. Yeah, instead of like doing what you do, which is like cripple the enemy's ability, like attack their command and control. Because that's like, that was so shocking, I think, about the first Gulf War is that... Then live TV watching, you know, you just cripple command and control. You attack that. So then Mm -hmm. you soften them up. We're no longer going to be like, we're just rolling in and seeing what's happening. It's like, no, we're going to reduce their their system to ashes and then we attack. Right, right. There's a really fun thing. Apparently for the F-15, there was a missile called the called the asm 135 asat was the name of it. Anti-satellite. Anti-satellite. Yeah. They would go in what's called a zoom climb. They'd get super, super high up and then release it. And that's like 
you know, when you have like a, a space vehicle or whatever, there's multiple stages to the rocket. Mm-hmm. The F-15 is stage one. <laughs> and then stage two is the actual burner on the missile or whatever. Nice. And it goes up into space and blows the thing up. We tested it one time. It worked, right? Yeah, it worked. It worked. Like 1985, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And then there was like a global ban on anti-satellite weapons which was then broken by China. (laughs) Like in 2007, I think it was, they blew up a satellite. And there's still debris from that explosion in orbit right now Mm -hmm. that's like tracked and logged. Yeah, when you blow up something in space, it's going to stay there. It's not going to fall. It doesn't fall back down to the ground. Which is like a problem. I think it's called Kessel Syndrome, where you have so much crap in orbit flying around, colliding with other stuff, making more crap in orbit. It's just this cascade, this exponential increase in like crap that you have to keep track of. And eventually space flight becomes extremely dangerous. Wonder how we'll deal with that actually. Just be really careful, I guess. Don't go get into a global war where you blow up everybody's satellites. Yeah. That's step one. Mm-hmm. But like that movie Gravity, just a little tiny like a nut, like a bolt that's thrown off into space. If it collides with something orbiting in the opposite direction, it can be catastrophic. You know, Mm -hmm. just tear this thing apart. Yeah. You're talking the velocities you're talking in orbit are so insanely high. Yeah. And it's like, talk about a bullet. I mean, a bullet's about the same size. It goes like a fraction of the speed as these things. Super bullet. (laughs) Super bullet, yeah. (laughs) And uh, my favorite character in the book, the, the one who shoots that thing off, is Emilia Nakamura. She's this F 15 pilot that is a ferry pilot that's like carrying planes over across the ocean for other people to Mm -hmm. use and then she like takes a commercial flight back and then flies back Mm -hmm. again on the way across the ocean she she comes across some badgers and all she has is oh the flying one (laughs) the flying (laughs) not not like little animal furry animals or like the wisconsin badgers she has to fight the wisconsin badgers (laughs) their their lacrosse team is going across the ocean (laughs) um like she uh all she has is a sidewinder missile in her vulcans and she like shoots down two of them and then later she shoots down two satellites so she becomes an, an ace (laughs) <laughs> well, no, you have to get five kills to be an oh, ace. Okay, sorry. She shoots down three planes and then mm-hmm. two satellites. At oh, that point. <laughs> they make a joke about her being the first space ace because space of that. Ace. It's like how he's shooting down observation balloons in World War I. Does, does that count? Yes. What? Oh, yeah. Well, you ever heard of balloon busters? No. So so back in World War I, they had these things they're called observation balloons. They're kind of like sausage shaped. They didn't look like round. They're like sausage shaped. Dirigible shaped. Dir- sort of like that. And they would have a observer who would sit in it and they would go kind of high up, about five, ten thousand 10,000 feet or whatever. And they would maybe a little bit lower, but they would observe the other side and they would have a telephone wire that ran down <laughs> and they would call and be like, I see troops gathering at these coordinates so artillery can bombard it. So they tended to be very heavily defended, sometimes by planes, but very often by anti-aircraft guns. And what, which, which if you're having explosions go off right next to you, that's probably a little dangerous for the balloon man. Oh, yeah. You know, they were considered exceptionally dangerous targets to attack mm-hmm. um, and they would they would attack them and, and destroy them, set them on fire. And they often used explosive dum-dum sort of bullets oh, wow. to like light them on fire. If you destroyed one, it was, your pilot was counted as part of your score. Mm-hmm. And some of them became like specialists in attacking. They called them balloon busters. <laughs> and those were people who destroyed five or more balloons on their own. Oh, wow. I think the most was some guy destroyed like 35. Jeez. It sucks for the guy who has to be in that basket. Yes, because a lot of them are filled with hydrogen. So, you know, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so you jump out. But interesting enough, an interesting fact about this. So in World War I, Allied pilots were not issued parachutes, even though there were experimental parachutes that existed. German pilots in 1918, after I think it was May or June, actually were issued it. So there were German pilots who successfully completed parachute jumps. Huh. Um, however, on both sides... Balloon observers were issued parachutes. Huh. So Allied and German. So they could sometimes jump out of them. And in fact, in the Great War series, Jonathan Moss destroys a balloon and then he machine guns the para- <laughs> the guy in the in his parachute. Because they were steady line parachutes that you didn't pull a rip cord. You just jumped out and then, you know, the line got pulled and then Interesting. Yeah. So did they have handles or were you just like hanging? I I don't know. I don't think they had handles. I think you had just held on to like That's a dangerous landing. You can't roll like you do. 
Well, I mean, look at World War II. They didn't have handles. They would just grab the, the rigging. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right, all right. I guess so. that's right. What about dirigible crew? Did they get parachutes? I don't think so. Oh, God. Zeppelins. <laughs> well, you know, the Germans were mainly the ones who used dirigibles, although the Allies apparently had dirigibles they uh -huh. did use for, like, naval stuff. Okay, that makes but sense. But the German Zeppelins, yeah. Although people did shoot down Zeppelins. You told me that a guy got a Victoria Cross for doing that. Yeah, one or two, I think. Yeah, at mm -hmm. least one. They drop bombs. They drop on bombs on it. <laughs> yeah, They'd fly over it and drop bombs. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but um, yeah, zeppelins. Zeppelins. Watch out for. But them. the really thing is, the Germans started using something called a Gotha bomber starting in 1917, and that was actually the big. Could they go across the channel? Or oh was yeah, that... they would attack London and what? Southeast England. Yeah, that's insane. Mm. Oh my God, that's ridiculous. Oh yeah, no, it's interesting. That there was like the war in the kind of on the English Channel. The um, they would launch from Belgium, a place called Zeebrugge, which is near Bruges. It's like the port of Bruges. It's mm -hmm. a little bit separated from the city, but yeah, stuff like that. So there was a lot of fighting around there, around Ostend and stuff like that, where the manifesto was written. That's right <laughs> about yeah. Cuba. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, so interesting, at least in my opinion. But um. There you go. Now you know about observation balloons. Are there any other non-airplane things that you can shoot down to become an ace? Like Helicopters now. There's a really? couple of people who shot down helicopters. And apparently there's a case of a helicopter shooting down a fighter plane. Apparently an Israeli pilot good. in a helicopter shot down like a Syrian MiG. How? Oh, God. <laughs> Got behind him in a dog fight. <laughs> 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 Well, you know, and then Rambo, he became an ace for ramming his tank. Oh, yeah, that, you know? <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> dedicated to the brave Mujahideen Indeed. fighters. Yeah, who will soon be fighting <laughs> very soon. On... In just a couple decades. <laughs> yeah. Um, but OK, helicopters. He, in that movie, can I just comment? That sure. He runs that whole damn tank by himself because at one point he's shooting the gun, but he misses it. And like he's shooting the gun, driving and shooting the machine gun. And yes, Soviet tanks of the time had auto loader systems okay. for their guns. But how the hell is he aiming the gun and driving it? It's not like a video game. <laughs> like people, separate people do separate things in tanks. And who's working the radio for God's sake? <laughs> yes. Oh no, I'm I'm kidding. But <laughs> who's giving the flag signals? You know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my goodness! What a great film. A great film. Mm, not my favorite Rambo. No. No. Didn't another one just come out recently? Last Blood. Yeah. I don't know anything about it other than it's set in Mexico, I think it is. Is it? Yeah. Oh, it's like Rambo. he's fighting cartel members or something. Of course he is. Right. Oh, Rambo. They made a children's cartoon Rambo series. I know. I've seen it. You can actually find it on YouTube. Some of it. How bizarre. What a bizarre thing. Yeah. Oh. 27% on the tomato meter for Last Blood. Yeah, that's not that's not a good sign. Almost four decades after they drew First Blood, Sylvester Stallone is back as one of the greatest action heroes of all time, John Rambo. Who's they? Oh, that's right. After they they drew First Blood, right. not him. Not me. Those cops here in Vermont. Is it set in Vermont? No, it was Washington State, although the book is okay. set in Kentucky. What? Okay. And... Oh my goodness, the book. You, if you ever have a chance to read the book, First Blood, I don't know if I've ever given it to you. I think I borrowed it in college uh -huh. briefly. Yeah. Well, if you haven't read it, I'll let you. It is like, because in the movie Rambo, he's like, I'm running away. Like, they can't catch me. In the book, he's like killing everybody, <laughs> like with stakes and shooting them and dropping people off cliffs. And it's like, yikes, and gutting people with knives and blowing, mm. just kills everyone in the town and blows it up at the end. Mm. It's it's just a little dark. A little, a little dark. dark side. Speaking of dark, let's say this war actually happened, this Red Storm Rising War. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine all the environmental problems from that. Like, yeah, in the book, dozens of nuclear submarines get sunk. Uh-oh. Runaway nuclear reactors everywhere in the ocean uh -oh. <laughs> like what i'm not an i'm not a physicist or whatever but that seems really dangerous yes that does like i know like in real nuclear reactors they put the rods underwater and the radiation can't go, get past like just a couple feet of water but like fish can swim down there next to those reactions they can get irradiated and uh -oh. then caught and then eaten mm -hmm. so like it's just a complete disaster i have a mega fish <laughs> 
the setup for this sci-fi channel movie of the week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rock monster. Some rocks got irradiated and now they're alive. Moby Dick 2. There's a Moby Dick set in space. What? Yeah. Oh, God. Space whale. Space whale. So is it like in Star Wars where there's the giant worm in space? Or is it like... I don't know. I don't know. Okay. It's a sci-fi channel. You really uh, shouldn't uh, ask a whole lot of questions because they don't know the answer. That's a very good point. You know, Reagan liked this book. Did he? Yeah. He said that it was... As much as jelly beans? <laughs> Does he like jelly beans? He loved jelly beans, Max. I, I didn't know that. Any particular flavor? or I just... don't know. Now that okay. I'm not sure. Okay. They're okay. Yeah, they're not my favorite thing. Yeah, not mine either. Mm-hmm. They're all right, I guess. But... He sent a copy to um, Margaret Thatcher and was like, you should read this. This is really good. There was also a video game adaptation of this game. <laughs> of course. I've looked at if videos. If there's a Longbow Apache <laughs> video game, then there's a video game for this. <laughs> I, uh, I've watched some videos on YouTube. It looks um, interesting. It's all sub stuff. It's oh. none of the uh, tank or anything. Oh, subs. Talking about subs. Yeah. And not just the kind with provolone on them. Not the ones that cost $5 and are a foot long. I'm talking about SSN, this other independent one he had. Oh, yeah. It's about a war America fights with China over the Spratly Islands <laughs> in the 90s. And it's about this submarine. And basically, it could be called Awesome American Submarine, the book. <laughs> because it just goes around and it sinks. And it's like gradients. Every type of Chinese submarine it goes against, it's harder than the one before. And then there's like the big boss submarine at the end. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, like basically Woo. everyone in the book should just be walking around with little American flags in their hands. Is it good, though? It was fine. Okay. It's actually a quick read. It's like maybe 200 pages and easily readable in a day. Not this one. This is like a thousand pages. No, Red Star Rising. He writes long books. Yeah. Tom Clancy. Well, he did write long books. That's true. Well, some, I mean, they still put his name on stuff to this day, like Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. That's right. Rainbow Six. Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. He has nothing he has nothing to do with them now. Yeah, especially now. Yeah. Well now that he has passed away, yeah. Uh-huh. But he actually he like started his own video game company. Really? Red Storm Entertainment, yeah. From the ah, Yes. Nice. I think maybe the f- most famous thing they did was the original Rainbow Six game. Mm-hmm. Actually, I remember that. It came out contemporaneously with the book. It was like a, it was like a double thing. Oh wow! Yeah, it's pretty Probably crazy. Pretty blocky and. <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah, looking at it nowadays, it looks kind of primitive. But I hear it's it holds up. I hear it's kind Just of like if you ever play the Tomorrow Never Dies video game, <laughs> primitive. <laughs> I actually own that. Believe it or not. I like Goldeneye better. Yeah. Mine's got the Blockbuster sticker still on it. It was, it was one of those. If only he said Hollywood video, I'd really be impressed. <laughs> My parents still have a copy of the Rocketeer from Blockbuster that they never took back. Hmm. They wow. paid they paid like the $20 for it or whatever. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Was it on VHS? I yeah. remember going and getting stuff on VHS at Blockbuster and Hollywood Video. That was fun. No VHS. Your mom's like, you can pick out one movie. And it's like, we're... we're we got to rent this. Oh. Yeah. And Let's you, look at this disinterested teenager who's working here. <laughs> What's a good movie to watch? I don't care. <laughs> it's like uh, you, you base your your movie selection entirely upon the cover. Yeah, pretty it, much. Does it look cool? Does it not look cool? Yeah. Oh, when you're a kid, you think stuff like... Home Alone 3 is the best movie I've ever seen. That was incredible. Dunstan checks in. Dunstan checks in. You know, you get what you what's right on the tin. You know, Dunstan checked in. It was it was amazing. He did check in. Yeah, Jason Alexander. But did they do a horror movie? Did Dunstan ever check out? <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> well, that's what um the Edgar Allan Poe story, Murders in the Rue Morgue. One of the first detective stories of all time, mm-hmm. written back in the 1800s. And the murderer, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read right the in story. the last 170 years. <laughs> <laughs> but the murderer is an orangutan. A monkey kills the, the murder victim. Like the monkey has a knife, stabs somebody, and then climbs up the chimney. And they somehow they figure that out. Hmm. But Also... His stories inspired that Edgar Allan Poe movie with John Cusack. <laughs> so, did he play Edgar Allan Poe? Or? I, I think so. Okay. I couldn't even. 
Yeah, I, I vaguely remember that coming out. Danny Trejo once said the celebrity he's most scared of is John Cusack. What? I know, right? Not himself? <laughs> Look at himself in the mirror? A man who's actually been to San Quentin, like yeah. literally. Yeah, that guy's no joke. You watch Spy Kids and he seems like such a nice guy. But... That's right. Then you watch Spy Kids 2. There's one with Sylvester Stallone. That's right. Talking yeah. about Rambo. Yeah, yeah. There's Spy Kids 3D. There's... That's Robert Rodriguez, isn't it? Yeah. The guy who directed Battle Angel Alita bizarrely i never saw that movie it's okay it's he also fine. directed um i think from dusk till dawn just well, talking we met someone who was in that film we did yeah we met fred williamson fred williamson yeah. that was a fascinating experience what a guy that guy's great yeah he was he was funny man he was very very funny and he also a great sense of humor i remember i went up to him and talked to him and like i had no idea he played football like professionally yeah, he played in the first super bowl <laughs> which is like yeah here's my super bowl ring i'm wearing it right yeah, which now. is interesting because he was on the team that lost and usually <laughs> they don't have super bowl rings but i think he just got one made he just made one <laughs> there's one video of the first Super Bowl. Some guy had some early recorder thing and recorded it off his oh, television. I thought for a second you're talking about the other recorder, you know, that, <laughs> doo, 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 which they made you learn in like fourth grade. Uh, he somehow, I don't know if he recorded it on tape or if he just pointed a camera at the screen and filmed it, but um, he has video of it and he keeps trying to sell it to the NFL, but the NFL keeps lowballing him. So it's not released yet. How old? This guy must be in his 70s. Yeah, maybe he'll die and his kid will sell it because they're like, ah, who cares? But but he actually is the only person who has a recording of the first Super Bowl. Yeah, like I think the whole thing. Like they didn't, the NFL didn't film it at the time? I don't think so. Yeah. I guess they would have broadcast it. But yeah. They would not have filmed it. Because there's a lot of lost media out there. Like there's, I, I totally don't care about Doctor Who, but there's a bunch of Doctor Who episodes that are lost forever. All they have are the, the audio. Because, like, for some reason, somebody took out a tape recorder and recorded the episode so they can listen to it later or whatever. So, like, that kind of defeats the point, doesn't it? Well, just use your imagination, man. Um, so it's like saying, I wanted to listen to Star Wars later, so I just recorded <laughs> the audiobook version of Star Wars. I'm going to record the movie The Artist on this, on this, on this tape recorder. Yeah. My favorite Buster Keaton film. I love that soundtrack. Um, well, um, cops. Dun, 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 dun. there's an animator i think his name is otaking he animated doctor who episodes that don't exist other than audio so it's like an animation but it's like like a stand-in for the hmm. footage they don't have interesting yeah that's yeah. very interesting well, I know with with silent films, there's a ton that are lost. Yeah, yeah. Like there's, preserved. there's whole scenes of Metropolis that are still not found because mm -hmm. people would get this two and a half hour movie and like, screw that. Nope. Cut this. Cut that. People are going to get bored. So I got to shorten the movie by 30 minutes or like to conform to like censorship stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, there's nudity here. There's kissing here. We can't show that, you know, that kind of thing. Interesting. I know it's interesting. A lot of movies from the 30s and 40s are actually in the public domain, some of them. Yeah, it's awesome. Like, It's a Wonderful Life. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Is, yeah. That's why... Well, actually, interesting thing, why it became a classic Christmas movie is that it, it did okay, I think, when it first came out, and that in the 60s or 70s or whenever the copyright was due to be renewed by whoever made it, like Fox or Paramount or whatever, they didn't. They like either forgot or like didn't care. Hmm. So they didn't renew the copyright, so it entered... Um, the public domain and then so these TV stations are looking for something to show at Christmas and like what's a Christmas film oh wait this is in the public domain we don't have to pay any royalties <laughs> or anything on this we don't have to pay any fees we can just play this I think after that companies have been much better about upping it but I'm pretty sure there's other stuff from there too well Disney Disney keeps rewriting copyright law so that Mickey Mouse will not be in the public domain they keep changing stuff around so yeah, mm -hmm. it's a little bit different these days. Mm -hmm. um, there's a documentary on Netflix. I believe it's called Four Came Back, or maybe it's Five Came Back. I can't remember. It was Five Came Back. Five Came Back. The, it's pretty good. It talks about it, yeah. it talks about Hollywood and directors during the mm -hmm. Second World War. And Frank Capra is one of the... Mm -hmm. Yes, directors, and he directed It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, and the guy who's enthusiastically talking about what a great director he is is Guillermo del Toro, huh. star of the video game Death Stranding. Yeah. Yes. Star of Blade 2. Blade 2. <laughs>
I, I bought the Blu-ray for Blade 2, and there's a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff on it. Does it explain why he does that weird, goofy, moving-around thing in one of the scenes, where it's like, he doesn't seem, like, real? The CGI went, like, oh, haywire. Oh, right, where, like, his head's, like, all... <laughs> <laughs> looks like a PlayStation 2 cutscene. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it does not explain that, but it does show you the making of... <laughs> they get Chris Christopherson and make a mold out of his body. So like when Blade opens up the blood tank and he's floating in it, that's not Chris Christopherson. That's like a gelatin dummy or whatever. Well, I with a wig. not. <laughs> Let's seal you inside of this thing. But it's so funny. Like there's like this weird looking Chris Christopherson dummy that they like have to airbrush and put a wig on and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, that's a bit strange. Yeah, yeah. Chris Christopherson, Rhodes Scholar. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Wh- which road, though, I'm wondering? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and now that he's a Rhodes Scholar, now in his mind, he secretly has Cecil Rhodes' <laughs> agenda burned into his his brain, whether he wants it or not. He wants to put a telegraph wire from, from the Cape from to the Cairo. From the Cape to Cairo. He's like, yeah. I just really want to go from Cape Town to Cairo. I just, oh, for some reason. But not by plane. Right. By and train. I, and I want to go spend extra amount of time in Zimbabwe for some reason. Yeah, I don't know like, why. Yeah, you're like, this, this place calls to me. You're like, Harare, this feels more like a Salisbury. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. He's like, my favorite character in any movie is the guy Leonardo DiCaprio plays in, in oh, Blood Diamond. Blood Diamond, he's from Rhodesia. Yeah. I'm here to see Major Zero. The big boom, boom, AK-47, the weird accent he does yeah. in that movie. Apparently, that's actually a pretty good Rhodesian accent. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Huh. I mean, I don't really know, but... Yeah, it's been so long since you've been to Rhodesia. I you know, know, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's an okay movie. That's that's a good but film. One of my favorite facts about modern Zimbabwe is that their way of fixing their crisis with their currency is they just abandoned it and started to use <laughs> other currencies. Like they use the Rand, South African Rand, and the American dollar. They're just oh. like, no more Zimbabwean dollars. Like, we don't accept this anymore. Like, that's a great way to all of that. That's how we're going to just get rid of huh. this bad money is say we can't be used anymore. Well, in India, they did something a little bit like that where um, I don't remember the exact details of it, but I think they were trying to crack down on either counterfeiting or some kind of smuggling or mm-hmm. whatever. And they just blanket said, if the serial number on your bill is before this, it's invalid. It doesn't work anymore. You have 48 hours <laughs> notice. You have 48 hours. <laughs> it's so weird, yeah. Somehow it was supposed to get rid of corruption. I don't really understand it exactly. I do know several countries in South and Central America, for sure Ecuador, and I think maybe, is it Costa Rica? Just use the American dollar. Hmm. I love how Ecuador, which is not a country that's <laughs> entirely friendly to the United States, is just like, we use the U.S. dollar. Well, isn't that where, um, what's his face, the, the WikiLeaks guy? He was hiding at the Ecuadorian embassy? Embassy, yeah, in London. In fact, mm-hmm. I walked by at one point the building he was in, and I looked up to see if I could see him. Could you? I didn't, unfortunately. Uh-huh. I would have waved at him if it did. Hi. Just be like, oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Hi. That was not that long after he'd gone in, and then he was in there seven years before they revoked his status and the British police could go and arrest him. What's up with him? What's happened I think recently? there's still an extradition procedures from the UK. Also, what is his name? I can't Julian remember. Assange, ah, also known as Benedict Cumberbatch in a very, very bad wig. The Fourth Estate? Is yeah, it? the Fourth Estate or whatever. I was told it was a terrible movie. Yeah, yeah. All I know is I saw the... <laughs> I just I saw the like the advertisements for it i'm like this can't be good he looks insane benedict he was in some dumb movie he's been in a couple ones that aren't he used to be such a prestigious name and now he's kind of dropped off somewhat eh, he still does stuff he was in something really stupid i can't remember the name. The imitation of it. game no actually that no, was pretty no. good yeah 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 turing um, that guy was actually weirder than he portrayed him really yeah turing was a pretty strange character what other movies? He's been in a couple ones that weren't great. He was Khan in Oh, Star God, Trek. that's right. Into Darkness. I don't like that movie. I don't think it's... Beyond, the next one, was way better, if you I ask me. I, 
you should check it out. It's pretty good. It's got um, what's her face, the Algerian lady that was in the Mummy remake, Sophia Botella. That's it. Oh. Yeah, she's an alien in that movie. Hmm. The Mummy remake. A fine actress. Yeah, the Mummy. The mummy remake. A fine film. A fine something. Well, it, I think it was, if I remember correctly, Alex Kurtzman and some other guy were like the guys that made that, mm-hmm. and they're now the guys in charge of Star Trek right now. Star Trek Discovery and all that stuff. And I think they did Star Trek Into Darkness, too, mm. which, not a fan of that film. It's so stupid. Peter Weller's in that movie. Peter Weller is? Yeah, from RoboCop. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he's like a Section 31 bad guy. It's it's so weird because the beginning of that movie is like dedicated to the memory of the victims of 9-11. It's like, why? What? Like, what? What does that have to why? do with anything? And then at the end of the movie, you see the, the like starship f- flying through all these arcologies, which are probably filled with millions of innocent people that are getting killed. And it's like, oh, now I understand. OK, that's why. Not a fan of that film. No. Um, the aircraft carrier Foch shows up in the book at one point. The French aircraft Ferdinand Foch? For, who's this? Ferdinand Foch? I don't Marshall know. Marshall Foch? Nope. He was, he was the French leader, basically like the Allied commander in the last year of the war. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Of, of like all the Allies? They pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Joseph Joff was before him, and then it became Ferdinand Foch. Uh, did Foch live until World War II? No, I think he died in the 20s or 30s. Mm-hmm. Although he was the one who said this isn't a peace this is an armistice for 20 years. Huh. He was actually right to yeah. the year. And he doesn't have the embarrassment of becoming a Peyton. That's right. Yeah. yeah. He died a hero. Although it's int- I'm trying to think of the major commanders. So Ludendorff died in the 30s. Hindenburg died in the 30s. Foch died in the 20s or 30s. But Pershing and Patan lived into the 40s. Like Pershing died after World War II, I think. Well, until he was murdered by that Mormon extremist. Oh, that's remember? right. <laughs> That's, That's a joke about the Great War series. Yeah. Um, he lived into his like late 80s. He had a nice tank named after him. Yeah. The M26 Pershing. Maybe. Is it the best tank of World War II? Mm, I don't know. Probably not the best tank. What is that, like an IS-2 or IS-3 or something? The is best that, tank? Is that the best one? Probably a T-34. Well, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. For its like role, of course. But I mean like... The head, best tank? Yeah, like head... Like, probably like pan- the Panther is probably like the best combination of firepower, armor, and maneuverability. Mm-hmm. No, my favorite tank is the M3. <laughs> the Honey. <laughs> the Lee. It's got so many guns. Oh, no, I was talking about the Stuart, but yes, the mm. Lee, even better. <laughs> one gun is good, but two... <laughs> Even better. Even better. So many crappy guns. Let's see so if we can get many. a 120 millimeter gun into that thing. <laughs> With just a weird pencil. Yeah. <laughs> really good at aiming at enemies who are slightly above you, but not good at moving horizontally. <laughs> what well, didn't like the Char B? They had one of those. Yes, things. the Char B. That's what it was based on. That's a big tank. See, I've seen one. I've stood next to one before. They're gigantic. Yeah, yeah. It's like ridiculous. Although my favorite still is that Russian tank, the T28 or T35, the one that had like six different turrets. It's like the T-100 where it's just two double stacked, one on top of the other. Oh, my God. So stupid. Yeah. But keep that armor flat. Yeah. Keep it very vertical and flat. I don't like sloping. Bounce right off. That's right. Boom, boom. And it hits them, you see. (laughs) Yeah. Like a ping pong, you know. (laughs) Was the steward an M3? Because the Lee was an M3. Was it an M2? Yeah. There, I think there was. I think it was the M two light M four is a Sherman. Yeah, the M four is a Sherman. Is there an M five? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> then there's like the M ten, the M thirty six. Right, like the, the 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 tank destroyer. Jumping right? around. I sort of like the Germans had like first through like twentieth Panzer, and then there was the hundred and sixteenth Panzer division. It's out of like nowhere. It's like why <laughs> make things as confusing as possible? That's right. Um, but there's like over a hundred infantry divisions for the Americans, right? But they actually did have like they roughly actually, there yeah. was, but there were some, for some reasons there wasn't like the 55th infantry division, but there was like the 63rd infantry division. It's like, uh, what? Mm. Huh? Uh-huh. Whatever. Is this a better book than SSN or is it just not really kind of I the think same? It, I think it fits within the, I don't know if one is better than the other. I think that they fit in a very specific niche, which is if you like fighting. I think it's not, I don't think this is like the book to really do a lot of social commentary, but I think if you want information about uh, tactical stuff, that's the best. Okay. Okay. So this is good. Yeah. It was good talking about this. I yeah. enjoyed it. 
I, I I've always wanted to read a book like this with the whole. You know, You've always wanted to read a book. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to, but I was too ashamed to admit that I never did until now. <laughs> but yeah, this was a lot of fun. Good on you, Tom Clancy. Mm-hmm. Good on you, Larry Bond. You did good. James Bond's American cousin. <laughs> Bond. Larry Bond. Larry Bond. <laughs> well, yeah. I think that's about it. I guess that's it. Well, this is Matt signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys.